Welcome to the second lesson of our educational online sessions. Today's topic is evolution and adaptation. Charles Darwin, the founder of modern theory of evolution, and he is named as Charles Darwin. The son and grandson of physicians, he enrolled as a medical student at the University of Edinburgh and after two years, however, he left to study at the University of Cambridge. He was not an exceptional student, but he was deeply interested in the natural world. On December 27, 1831, a few months after his graduation from Cambridge, he sailed as a naturalist aboard the HMS Beagle on round the world trip that lasted until October 13, 1836. Darwin was not often able to disembark for extend, extended trips ashore to collect natural specimens. And most of his extraordinary natural specimens are among the top in the world and have been displayed in many places and are actually re- show, that, show a new way and a new de- door is opened to the life of animals and how they evolve. The discovery of fossil bones from large extinct animal mammals in Argentina and the observation of numerous species of finches in the Galapagos Islands, something which Charles Darwin was very famous for, were amongst the events created with stimulating Darwin's interest in how species originated. In 1859, he published On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, a book which I myself also have it, and it shows that in this precise establishment, the theory of evolution and most important, the role of natural selection in determining its course. Charles Darwin lived from 1809 to 1882 and Alfred Russell Valens 1823 and 1913. They were the two main naturalists who kept their whole life exploring and researching about the history of evolution. And they were jointly credited with coming up with the theory of evolution by natural selection, having co-published on it in 1859. Darwin has generally overshadowed Valens since the publication of On the Order of Speech in 1859. Evolutionary History of Life The evolutionary history of life on Earth traces the process, processes by which living and fossil organisms evolved, from the earliest emergence of life to the present day. Earth formed about 4.5 billion years ago. And evidence suggests life emerged prior to 30.7 billion years ago. Although there is some evidence of life as early as 4.1 to 4.28 billion years ago. It remains controversial due to the possible non-biological formation of purported fossils. The similarities among all known present-day species indicate that they have diverged through the process of evolution from a common ancestor. So today as we know it, we are taking for granted that we live among diverse communities of animals that feed on each other. Our ecosystems are structured by feeding relationships like killer whales eating seals, which eat squids, which feed on krill. These and other animals require oxygen to extract energy from their food. So, but that's not how life on earth used to be. The earliest life forms we know of of were microscopic organisms, microbes, that left signals of their presence in rocks about 3.7 billion years ago. The signals consisted of a type of carbon molecule that is produced by living things. Evidence of microbes was also preserved in, in the hard structure stromatolites they made which date to 3.5 billion years ago. Stromatolites are created as sticky mats of microbes trapped and bin sediments into layers. So we can see all these circle-like structures in in fossils. Minerals precipitated inside the layers, creating durable structures even as the microbes die off. The earliest evidence of life comes from biogen biogenetic carbon structures and stimulite fossils discovered in 3.7 billion years old. Metasedimentary rocks from Western Greenland. Microbial mats of coexisting bacteria and archaea were the dominant forms of life in the early Archean epoch. 
and many of the major steps in early evolution are thought to have taken place in this environment. With an environment devoid of oxygen high in methane, for much of its history, Earth was not been able to sustain life and wasn't a welcoming place for animals at all. An oxygen atmosphere. When cyanobacteria evolved at least 2.4 billion years ago, they set the stage for a remarkable transformation. They became Earth's first photosynthesizers, making food using water and sun's energy, and releasing oxygen as a result. This catalyzed a sudden dramatic rise in oxygen, making the environment less hospi hospitable for other microbes that could not tolerate oxygen at all. Evidence for this great oxidation event is recorded in changes in sea floor locks. When oxygen is around, iron reacts chemically with it. And it, so we can see it, it rusts and it gets or it gets ox oxidized and gets removed from the system. But rocks dating to before the event are stuck with bands of iron. Rocks dating to after the event do not have iron bands at all, showing that oxygen was now in the picture. With an environment devoid of oxygen before, now life was a bit more hospitable on the planet. After the initial pulse of oxygen, it stabilized at lower levels, where it would remain for a couple of billion years more. And slowly, slowly as, in fact, the cyanobacteria died and drifted down through the water, the decomposition of their bodies probably reduced oxygen levels. So the ocean was still not sustainable for environments for most life forms that need ample oxygen. The evolution of photosynthesis around 3.5 billion years ago eventually led to a build-up of its waste product, oxygen, in the atmosphere, leading to a great oxidation event beginning around 2.4 billion years ago. Multicellular life. How are other inno innovations were occurring? While they can process lots of chemicals, microbes did not have the specialized cells that are needed for complex bodies. Animal bodies have various cells, such as skin cells, blood, bone, which contain organelles, each doing a dis distinct job. Microbes are just single cells with no organelles and no nuclei to package their DNA. Something revolutionary happened. As microbes began living inside other microbes, functioning as organelles for them, mitochondria, the organelle that produ produce, uh, pro processes or produces food into energy, evolved from these mutually beneficial relationships. Also for the first time, DNA became packaged in nuclei. The new complex cells, eukaryotic cells, boosted specialized parts playing specialized roles that supported the whole cell. Cells also began living together, probably because certain beneficial could be obtained. Groups of cells might be able to feed more efficiently or gain protection from simply being bigger, living collectively. Cells began to support the needs of the, of the group of by each cell doing a specific job. Some cells were tasked with making junction to hold the group together, while other cells made digestive enzymes that could break down food. The earliest evidence of eukaryotic cells that were complex cells with organelle dates from 1.85 billion years ago. And while they, ha they may have been present earlier, their diversification accelerated when they started using oxygen in their metabolite metabolism. Later, around 1.7 billion years ago, multicellular organisms began to appear, with differentiated cells performing specialized functions. Bilateria, animals having a left and a right side that are mirror images of each other appeared by 55, 555 million years ago. Now the first animals. These Clusters of special cells, the eukaryotic cells, cooperating cells, you know, eventually became the first animals, which DNA evidence suggests evolved around 800 million years ago. 
sponges were among the earliest animals and we can still see them today. While chemical co uh, compounds from sponges are preserved in rocks as old as 700 million years ago, molecular evidence points to sponges developing even earlier. Oxygen levels in the oceans were still low compared to today, but as we know, the sponges are able to tolerate conditions of low oxygen. Although like other animals, they require oxygen to metabolize, they don't need much because you know they don't they don't move or they're not indeed very active. They feed while sitting still by extracting food particles from the water that is pumped through their bodies by specialized cells. The simple body plan of a sponge consists of layers of cells around water filled cavities, supported by hard skeletal parts. The evolution of ever more complex and diverse body plans would eventually lead to a distinct group of mammals. The assembly instructions for an animal's body plan are in its genes. Some genes act like orchestra conductors controlling the ex expressions of many other genes as, at specific places and times to correctly assemble the components. While they were not played out immediately, there is evidence that parts of instructions for complex bodies were present even in the earliest of animals. The first plants, the earliest complex land plants date back to around 850 million years ago from carbon isotopes in pre cambrian rocks. While algae-like multicellular organisms that are land plants dated back even to about 1 billion years ago. Although evidence suggests that microorganisms formed the earliest terrestrial ecosystem at least 2.7 billion years ago, microorganisms are thought to have paved the way for the inception of land plants in the Ordovician. Land plants were so successful that they are thought to have the contributed to the late Devonian extinction event. The long coastal chain implied seems to involve the success of early three archaeopteryx drew down CO2 levels, leading to global cooling and lower sea levels. Roots of archaeopteryx fostered soil development, which increased rock weathering, and the subsequent nutrient runoff may have triggered algae algal biome blooms resulting in anoxic events which cause marine life die-offs. Marine species were the primary victims of the late Devonian extinction. Eudicurian biota By about 580 million years ago, the Eudicurian period, there was a proliferation of other organisms in addition to sponges. These varied sea frog creatures with bodies shaped like fronds, ribbons, and even quills lived alongside sponges for 80 million years. Their fossil evidence can be found in sedimentary rocks around the world. However, the body plans of most Edicron animals did not look like modern groups. By the end of the Eudicarian, oxygen levels rose, approaching levels sufficient enough to sustain oxygen based life. The early sponges may actually have helped boost oxygen by eating bacteria, removing them from the decomposition process. Tracks of an organism named Dickinsonia costata suggest that it may have been moved along the sea bottom, presumably feasting on mats of microbes. However, about 541 million years ago, most of the Edicaran creatures disappeared, signaling a major environmental change, evolving animal body plants, feeding relationships and environmental engineering may have played a role. Burrows found in fossil record dating to the end of Edicaran revealed that worm-like animals had begun to excavate the ocean bottom. These early environmental engineers disturbed and maybe irated the sediment, distributing conditions to other Edicaran animals. As environmental conditions deteriorated, for some animals, they improve for others, potentially catalyzing a change over in the species. The Cambrian period, 541 to 485 million years ago, witnessed a wild explosion of new life forms. Along with new borrowing life lifestyles came hard bodied parts like shells and spines, hard bodied parts also occur towards more active animals. With the 
find heads and tails for directional movements to chase prey. Active feeding by well-armored animals like trilobites may be further disrupted the sea flow that the soft eddicurian creatures have lived on. Unique feeding styles part partitioned the environment, making room for more diversifications of life while Waptia scored the ocean bottom. Peripulid worms borrowed into the sediment. Vivaxia attached to sponges and Anomalo Caris cruised above. However, there was a Cambodian explosion on the time. Many of those odd looking organisms were revolutionary experiments, such as the five eyed Opabinia. However, some groups such as the tribalites thrive and dominated there for hundreds of millions of years, but eventually went extinct. Stromalotolites, reef building bacteria, also declined, and reefs made by organisms called brachiopods arose as conditions on earth continued to change. Today's dominant reef builders, the hard corals, did not emerge until a couple of years, a couple of million years later. However, despite all the changes that were to come by the end of the Cambrian, nearly all of existing animals, types of phyla, including mollusks, arthropods, annelids, and etc., were established, and food webs were emerging slowly, forming the foundation for ecosystems on Earth today. I'll be going into more details of the things which we discussed right now. So, environment, environmental and evolutionary impacts of microbial mats. Microbial mats are multi-layered, multi-speech colonies of bacteria and other organisms that are generally only a few millimeters thick, but still contain a wide range of chemical environments, each of which favor a different set of microorganisms. To some extent, each mat forms its own food chain as the byproduct of each group of microorganisms generally serves as food for adjacent groups. Somatolites are stubby pillars built as microorganisms in mats slowly migrate upwards to avoid being smothered by sediment deposited on them by water. Somatolites was reported from the same part of Australia as previously once in rocks dated to 3.5 billion years ago. In modern underwater mats, the top layer often consists of photosynthesizing cyanobacteria which create an oxygen-rich environment, while the bottom layer is oxygen-free and often dominated by hydrogen sulfide emitted by the organisms living there. Oxygen is toxic to organisms that are not adapted to it, but greatly increase the metabolic efficiency of oxygen adapted organisms. Oxygen became a significant component of Earth's atmosphere about 2.4 billion years ago, although eukary eukaryotes may have been present much earlier, but the oxygenation of the atmosphere was a fascinating advantage for the evolution of the most complex eukaryotic cells, from which all multicellular organisms are built. The boundary between oxygen-rich and oxygen-free areas in microbial mats would have moved upwards when photosynthesis, or photosynthesis shut down overnight and then downwards as it re resumed on the next day. This would have created selection pressure to organisms in this intermediate zone to acquire the ability to tolerate and then to use oxygen possibly via endocymosis where one organism lives in sand, another and both of them benefit from their associations. Diversification of eukaryotes Eukaryotes may have been present long before the oxygen of the atmosphere, but most modern eukaryotes require oxygen, which is mitochondria used to fuel the production of ATP. The internal energy supply of all known cells Fossils of the algae Gripanae have been reported in 1.85 billion years old rocks and indicates the, that eukaryotes with organelle had already evolved. A diverse collection of fossils 
of algae were found in rocks dated between 1.5 and 1.4 billion years ago. The earliest known fossils of fungi date from 1.43 billion years ago. Emergence of animals The first animals which was having all the traits of living organisms including feeding, protection and all these things were jellyfishes. As we know it, animals are multicellular eukaryotes and are distinguished from plants, algae and fungi by lacking cell walls. The earliest widely accepted animal fossils are the rather modern looking cynidarians, which are like the groups that include jellyfishes, sea animals and hagi, possibly from around 580 million years ago. The small shiny fauna are a very mixed collection of fossils found between the late Edicaran and Middle Cambrian periods. The earliest Claudina shows signs of successful defense against predators and may indicate the start of an evolutionary arm race. Some tiny early Cambrian shells almost certainly belong to mollusks, while the owners of some armory plates were actually trilobites. And from that time slowly, the animals evolved dramatically. The Eutros mess and the first vertebrates evolved. The other major group, the Dithrostomes, contained invertebrates such as starfish and sea urchins, echinoderms, as well as chordids. Many echinoderms have hard calcite shells, which are fairly common from the early Cambrian small shell fauna onwards. Other Deuterostome groups are soft bodied. The Chordats are another major Deuterostome group. Animals with a distinct dorsal nerve cord. The Chordats include soft bodied invertebrates such as tunicates as well as vertebrates animals with a backbone. While tunicate fossils pred predate the Cambrian explosion. The Chain, changing young fossils and much more fossils appear to be true vertebrates and of course they are all distinct vertebra which may have been slightly mineralized vertebrates with jaws such as Acanthodians, the one which you see in the picture first appeared in the late Ordovician colonization of land. Adaptation to life on land is a major challenge. All land organisms need to avoid drying out and all those above microscopic size must create specialized structures to withstand gravity. Respiration and gas exchange systems have to be changed also. Before the colonization of land, soil, a combination of minerals, particles and decomposed organic matter did not exist. Land surfaces would have been either bare rocks or unstable sand produced by weathering. Water and any nutrients in it would have drained away very quickly. Mad forming cyanobacteria could have gradually evolved resistance to desiccations as they spread from the seas to intertidal zones and then to land. Soil formations would have been very slow until the appearance of boring animals, which mix the minerals and organic components of soil and whose feces are a major source of organic components. Boros have been found in Ordovician sediments and are attributed to annelids, worms or arthropods. Land invertebrates. Animals had to change their feeding and excretatory systems and most land animals develop the difference in ret uh, refractive index between water and air require changes in their eyes to help them adopt to their life on land on the other hand in some ways movement and beating became easier and the better transmission of high frequency sounds in the air encouraged the development of hearing the earliest confirmed fossils of flying insects date from the late Carboniferous, but it is thought that insects 
developed the ability to fly in the early Carboniferous or even the late Dovinian. This gave them a wider range of ecological niches for feeding and breeding and a means of escape from predators and from unfavorable changes in their markets. The fossil, the fossil record of other major invertebrate groups on land is poor. None at all for non parasitic flatworms, nematodes, or nematians. Some par par uh, par uh, parasitic, for example, nematodes, have been fossilized in amber. Analyzed worm fossils are known from the Carboniferous, but they may still have been aquatic animals. The earliest fossils of gastropods on land date from the late Carboniferous, and this group may have been may have had enough to wait until leaf litter became abundant enough to provide the moist conditions they need. Early land vertebrates. Tetrapods, vertebrates with four limbs, evolved from other repeat distant fish. We can say, or the, the local fish was over there on that time, or a relatively short time span during the late Devonian, 370 to 360 million years ago. The early groups are grouped together as Labyrinthodonita. So. They retain aquatic fry like tadpoles, a system still seen in modern amphibians today. From the 1950s to the early 1980s, it was thought that the tetrapods evolved from fish that had already acquired the ability to crawl on land. Possibly, in order to go from a pool that was drying out to one that was deeper. However, in 1987, nearly complete fossils of Acanthostega from about 363 million years ago showed that this late Devonian transitional animal had legs and both lungs and gills but could never have survived on land. Its limbs and its wrists and ankle joints were too weak to bear its weight. Its ribs and other things were too short to prevent its lungs from being squeezed flat by its weight. Its fish-like tail fin would have been damaged by dragging on the ground. The current hypothesis is that Acanthostega, which was about 1 mm or 3.3 feet long, was a woolly aquatic predator that hunted in shallow water. Its skeleton differed from that of most fish in ways that enabled it to raise its head to breathe air while its skeleton, while its body actually, remained submerged, including its jaw, showed modification that would have you know enabled it to gulp air also like today's lungfish we can say the bones at the back of its skull are locked together providing strong attachment of attachment points for muscles that rise its head the head is not joined to the shoulder grindle and it has a distinct neck the Devonian proliferations of land plants may help to explain why air breathing would have been an advantage Leaves falling into streams and rivers would have encouraged the growth of aquatic vegetation. This would have attracted grazing vertebrates and small fish that preyed on them. They would have been attractive prey, but the environment was unstable for big marine predator fish. Air beating would have been necessary because these waters would have been short of oxygen, since warm water holds less dissolved oxygen than cooler marine waters and since the decomposition of vegetation would have used some of the oxygen as well. And now we get to the part where most of us know about it. Amniotes whose eggs can survive in dry environments, actually before amniotes evolved amphibians as well. So slowly amphibians changed, found dry skins and found ways to lay eggs on dry land by having a leather covering. And Aminots probably evolved in the late Carboniferous period, 330 to 298.9 million years ago. The earliest fossils of the two surviving Aminot groups, Synapsids and Sorpsids, date from around 313 million years ago. However, at the time, these were all in temperate zones at middle latitudes. And there is evidence that hotter, drier environments near the equator were dominant by sauropsids and amphibians. 
The Permian Triassic extinction event wiped out almost all land vertebrates, as well as great majority of other life. During the slow recovery from the catastrophe, it is estimated that to have taken around 30 million years, a, pre a previously obscure sauropsid group became the most abundant and diverse terrestrial vertebrates. A few fossils of, you know, our archosaur reforms, ruling lizard forms, have been found in late Ferrian rocks. But by the Middle Triassic period, archosaurs were the dominant land vertebrates. Dinosaurs distinguished themselves from other archosaurs in late Triassic and became the dominant of vertebrates of the Jurassic and Cretaceous periods. 201 to 0.3 to 66 million years ago, during the late Jurassic, birds evolved from small predatory theropod dinosaurs. While the archosaurs and dinosaurs were becoming more dominant in the Triassic, the mammalia form successors of the Thrapsids evolved into small, mainly nocturnal insectivores. Another time, the first birds inherited teeth and long bony tails from their dinosaur ancestors, but some had developed only toothless beaks by the late Jurassic and short pygostyle tails by the Earth by the early Cretaceous. The ecological role may have promoted the evolution of mammals, for example, nocturnal life may have accelerated the development of endothermy, warm bloodness, and hair or fur. But by 195 years ago, in the early Jurassic, there were animals that were very likely like today's mammals in a number of respects. After dominating land vertebrate niches from about 150 million years ago, the non avian dinosaurs perished in the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction event 66 million years ago, along with many other groups of organisms. Mammals throughout this time of the dinosaurs had been restricted to a narrow range of taxa, size and shapes, but increased rapidly in size and diversity after the extinction, with bats taking to the air with 13 million years and cetaceans to the sea within 15 million years. Another time, slowly flowering plants came to be as they are. The first flowering plants appeared around 130 million years ago. The 250,000 to 400,000 species of flowering plants outnumber all other ground plants combined and are the dominant vegetation in most terrestrial ecosystems. There is fossil evidence that flowering plants diversified rapidly in the early Cretaceous from 130 to 90 million years ago and that their numbers arise was associated with the pollinating insects. Among modern flowering plants, mag magnolia, or magnolia as we call it, are thought to be close to the common ancestor of the group. However, paleontologists have not succeeded in identifying the earliest stages in the evolution of flowering plants. And as mammals slowly changed, apes came to be as they are. And from that, modern humans suddenly arose. Modern humans evolved from the lineage of upright walking apes that has been traced back over six million years ago to Cylanthropus. The first known stone tools were made up about 2.5 million years ago, apparently by Australopithecus Garhi, and there were found near animal bones that bear scratches made by these tools. The earliest hom hominins had chimpanzee sized brains, but there has been a fourfold increase in the last three million years ago. A statistical analysis suggests that hominin brain size depends on almost completely on the date of the fossil, while the species of which they are assigned by only slight 